David said, one thing I ask of the Lord, this I seek. And my guess is if we were to think about it, this, this whole idea about one thing, right? What is that one thing that the Lord is asking of each one of us? David's was, there is one thing. I love David first off. I love David because he was great. What David did, he did big. He loved the Lord big. He sinned big. He repented big. He, David did it all. And the thing is, is even with everything that he did, we still have a positive feeling towards David. If we think about all the horrible things he did, there's something about grace working in somebody's life that moves them and changes them and transforms them. So David could say, there's just one thing I want, and I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, which is not a bad deal, amen? I mean, think about that, to be able to imagine ourselves dwelling in the house of the Lord and what that's going to be like. We were talking about it the other day. And the scripture reminds us that no mind can imagine, no ear can hear or see or anything like that about what the house of the Lord is going to be like. But I agree with David that that's where I want to be. Amen? That's what this is all about. This is supposed to be leading us to the house of the Lord. If that's not the path you're on, if that's not the direction you're going, if what you're doing right now is not leading you to dwell in the house of the Lord for the rest of your life, I suggest you get on a different road. Amen? David says, one thing, one thing I like is to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That was his one thing. What's your one thing? That one thing that you desire. I was praying and thinking about that one thing, and the scene from a movie came back to my mind, and it was the movie City Slickers. It's a classic movie, I'm sure. Actually, I'm always really careful about doing things like this, because like, there could be other scenes in the movie that are just like totally awful. I was doing one youth conference in this, this scene from Braveheart. Uh, let's just say they started the clip about 10 seconds too early. <laughs> I had to apologize to a lot of parents. Uh, but let's just show that, that clip from City Slickers. Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. That's great, but... What's the one thing? That's what you've got to figure out. So that's what we have to figure out. It's funny, if you go to the comments on YouTube under the clip, the second comment is, it's Jesus. I mean, that's the one thing, it's Jesus. Okay, I get that. But what is the one thing? What does it look like for us? One of the things I love about my nieces and nephews and kids in general is they're able to really single, be singly focused. Like when they make up their mind on something they want to do, they do it. And I remember there's an occasion a number of years ago with my niece, and she's now 30-something now, but at the time she was maybe six or seven years old. And I was coming home, and I was going to take her to the movie. Oh, crap. <laughs> Little Mermaid, I think it was. Little Mermaid. Who's, who's the little princess in Mermaid? Is it Ariel? All you guys are like, I don't know. And, and all, the, all, all the grandmothers out there, the mothers out there know exactly. So she was all excited. So whenever we would talk on the phone, she goes like, Uncle Dave, when you come home, you're going to take me to the movie. I said, we're going to go to the movie. And she's all excited. And every time we're on the phone, she sent me these little things through her dad, these little clips of uh, pictures of the movie and all that. So I come home, and she's excited. We get together the day I go, and I pick her up, and we go to lunch, and we take her to basically ice cream and just let her eat whatever she wants. And we drive up to the theater, and when I first get to the theater, I'm a little anxious because there's a lot of people there. So I walk up to the theater, and we go up to buy her two tickets, and she's almost crying. She's so excited. And I say, two tickets for The Little Mermaid, and the lady says, we're sold out. This is why you don't have children, right? <laughs> exactly. So I... I explain to a six-year-old girl, they're sold out, right? It's like, well, Uncle Dave, you promised. You promised you'd take me to see Ariel. I want to see Ariel. <laughs> so literally, I started bartering, bartering people. It's like, I'll give you $500 for your seat, all right? <laughs> she can go by herself. I don't, even, I don't even want to see this movie, honestly, right? The sense of being single-minded that we have. What's that one thing for us? I was amazed, and obviously the, the answer to this is Jesus, but we're going to talk about what does that mean, but I'm amazed at the number of people, their one thing ought not be their one thing. That one thing that motivates their life. How many people, if you're honest, you're, you're largely motivated by fear? 
You do things or don't do things because you're afraid. You're afraid what might happen. You're afraid what could happen. You're afraid what people would say. You're afraid what your parents would say. You're afraid what your kids would say. You're afraid what your spouse would say. They were motivated by fear. Remember a number of years ago, there was a guy, and he was motivated by a secret. Something awful had happened to him when he was a little boy from some neighborhood kids. And that secret motivated every part of his life. He would go on and he would tell a story. He was in high school, and in high school he was doing this lab. It was some science lab, and there were a couple of guys that were across the science room, across the classroom, and they were laughing. And in his mind, had no, no connection to reality, but in his mind they were laughing because they knew what had happened to him when he was a little boy. No, no touch with reality, but that's what he believed. Literally walks across the classroom, starts a fight with these kids, gets expelled. I mean, his life becomes this profound mess. Ends up in Reno, messed up, alcoholic, and he encounters Jesus. And it changes his life. And he would begin to share about that time when he was no longer going to be bound to that secret. And he would stand up and he would give talks at retreats. He was working mostly with young people. And this thing that he was afraid of anybody finding out, he would actually talk about. Because it wasn't what motivated his life anymore. That had changed. What motivates your life? What's that one thing? And I'm sure that it probably changes and there are different things. But, but what I want to talk about is, is this mission. Yeah, if we're going to be following Jesus, if we're going to be faithful to him, what's that one thing that's absolutely necessary, that each one of us is able to embrace, or else it's not going to be possible. I want to suggest, and it's a word that I don't think we generally like, what I want to look at this morning is that that one thing is obedience. I hate obedience, <laughs> right? You know, we're, we're, if that, even that word, we just need to find a different, actually, I, I was wrestling with the word, I love the word faithfulness. I love faithfulness. But there's a difference between obedience and faithfulness. Faithfulness is a reflection on how obedient we are. And the reality is, is I think we've always had a hard time with obedience. On the first night, Pete was talking about Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve are in the garden, and there's just this beautiful image of abiding with the Lord. The scripture says that Adam and Eve were walking through the garden in the middle of the day. They were naked with the Lord. Everything is just wonderful. There's, there's no sense of problem or pain or struggle or, or anything like that. And the Lord says to them, I think this is profoundly beautiful, you are free. And that we ought to continue to reflect and think about that. The Lord created Adam and Eve, created all of us in freedom. And he says, you are free. You're free to do whatever and to do whatever. He's created us that way. You are free to eat of any, any fruit, just not this one tree. Do you ever find that on, on Fridays during Lent, you crave a hamburger? Even though you might not have had a hamburger in like six weeks, but that Friday during Lent, right? You just... Why? Because ah, we just don't like to be told no. You can eat of all of it. I mean, this tree is no different than this tree. Just don't eat of this one. What does Eve do? Adam's over praying his rosary. <laughs> actually, 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 Adam shouldn't have been, Adam should have been there. No serpent should be able to approach a man's bride without him being there in front of him. Amen? And Adam and Eve and you and I, let's not kid ourselves, eat of the fruit. And what happens because of their disobedience? And this is the same in my life today. What happens because of their disobedience? Number one, they lose union with God. They had union with God. They were walking in the garden, in the middle of the day, naked. And they were okay with that. And the first thing they do is they cover themselves, and then they hide from him. Can you imagine? Actually, some of you can. Being afraid of God. I mean, the image are so stark, walking in the, in the middle of the day with the Lord, hand in hand, peace, joy, presence, right? And then next, 
covering themselves, hiding. And this is remarkable. God says, where are you? I'm telling you, if it was me, I wouldn't come looking. I wouldn't have come looking. But the reality is we pay attention to the scriptures. So oftentimes the scriptures are a story about God looking for us. And this is ridiculous. Again, I wouldn't go looking. It's a lot like my mother. When we were little, we were playing hide-and-go-seek in the middle of the day when mom was just going crazy because she had six kids. And she says, let's play a game. And say, that's great, mom. Let's play hide-and-go-seek. Okay, you guys run, hide, and be as quiet as you can, all right? And I'm going to come looking for you. It's like, this is great. So we, we run and we're hiding. It's like, okay, be quiet, be quiet. And she's like 10 and she's still not looking. Mom, mom is awful at this game, right? <laughs> An hour and a half later, it's like, and you go in and she's having her coffee. She says, oh, you guys are, yeah. God comes looking for us, all right? So the first one we lose is we lose union with God. Two, there's shame. When we're disobedient, we lose union with God and we, we are, we're filled with shame. They cover themselves. They don't even want to be seen by him. Such is the nature of disobedience. And finally, death. Death. Death enters the equation. Death in our soul, death in our spirit, hope, peace, joy, and literally death. Death, separation from God. Adam and Eve didn't or couldn't or wouldn't be obedient. But honestly, we're not that different. We're not that different. There's occasion with my little niece, and, and I just love the fact that my nieces and nephews, I get to tell stories about them because I never did anything bad, so I have to be able to look at them. <laughs> so this is the same niece who comes home. This is great. She comes home from school one day, and she was on the bus, and she was sitting in the front seat next to the bus driver, and, and she always sat in the back of the bus, always sat in the back of the bus. So when she comes off the bus, my sister says, you know, Molly, I'll, I'll <laughs> throw her under the bus. Molly, why were you sitting next to the bus driver? And she goes, I don't know. I don't know. I think maybe he wanted to get to know me better. <laughs> and then she says, or I got in trouble for spitting out the window, right? <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure which one it is. But anyway, she had, she had done something, and my mom says to her, my, she had done something wrong, and my mom says, you know, Molly, don't do that. And Molly says, you're not the boss of me, right? To which my sister said, Molly, everybody's the boss of you, right? Everybody's the boss. But we don't like that. I mean, the reality is, is we don't, out, we don't outgrow that. We do not like to be told what we should and what we should not do. But I suggest that one thing that I want to reflect on, the one thing I invite you to think about, the one thing I invite you as you leave today to reflect and pray and go before the Lord is, are you, are we obedient? Because it's at the heart of the spiritual life. We take a look at, at why it is that we're supposed to be obedient. And I think one of the struggles we have is it's hard to be obedient to somebody we don't know. It's hard to be obedient to this kind of this vague power or, or something that's going to restrict us that's out there. But I suggest something changes when we become in love with someone. That, that that is ultimately obedience. There's something about being obedient just because you're told to do. Okay, fine. But there's something profoundly different about being obedient because we love. We find in the scriptures in John 14, 21. It says, whoever has my commandments and observes them is the one who loves me. Brothers and sisters, our ability to be obedient to the Lord is directly connected to our love of him. Don't tell me you love God and you're not obedient to him. I can't say that I love him and I give my life to him if I'm not being obedient to him. Woo! Scripture goes on and says, what the heck was that? <laughs> that was awkward. I don't know, it just like came from... Oh, he probably was John Bullyu. <laughs> John and I were... This is, this is the problem about being around for too long. John and I were roommates together in college. And the problem is, is I can't talk about anything he did because it's now confessional, and he can say anything, so. <laughs> My life is so complicated. <laughs> okay, so Scripture says, whoever loves me will keep my word. This is just phenomenal. Whoever loves me will keep my word, 
and my father will love him, and he will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Whoever doesn't love me isn't obedient. Yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the father who has sent me. We show our love in our obedience, our love by how obedient we are to him. I mean, the worst thing I hated, the thing I hated to hear from my mom and my dad when I was young was I'm so disappointed in you. I mean, occasionally I went and I did something really stupid and I came back at home and, and moms are just so good at this. She was sitting in her bed and she was kind of seated up and there was a light little candle off to the side. And my mom's got MS, so her rosary beads were always really big. So she had this big rosary over her lap and, and she's praying a rosary in tears. I think she probably sprayed herself with bottled water, but <laughs> like tears just going down her cheeks and it glistened in the candlelight and I walk in and she's like, I'm so disappointed in you, right? If I didn't love her, or if she didn't love me, and somebody said, I'm so disappointed in you, it's like, I, don't, I really don't care what you feel or what you, but, but because she loves me and I love her, to hear that I'm disappointed in you it just breaks my heart, right? That there's something that changes about obedience and our desire to be obedient when we know that we're loved, when we know that the one who is asking something of us loves us. And we show our love in our we show our love for God by our ability to be obedient of what He asks of us. If I think and reflect about the vast majorities of the problem in the church that we experience, it's because men and women haven't been obedient haven't been faithful, haven't lived the gospel, haven't been faithful to the teachings of the church. It, it seems to me that it continually comes back to obedience. And we find that in the scriptures, that, that if the foundation of our walk with Jesus is one of being obedient to what he asks of us. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Everyone who listens to these words of mine and acts on them will be like the wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and buffeted the house. But it did not collapse it. It had been built soundly on rock. And everyone who listens to these words of mine but does not act on them, who is not obedient to them, will be like the fool who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and it buffeted the house, and it collapsed and was completely ruined. Mark spoke, everybody, Mark, Bart, Sarah, Pete, all spoke of the winds that are buffeting this house. We can look around. It's not hard for us to see it. It's everywhere. In this house, this house that we call the church, or this house that we call me, the temple of God, the winds and the storm is buffeting. And we have to ask ourselves, what is the foundation that we're being built on? And Jesus says, if that foundation isn't him in his teachings and being faithful to that, it will be destroyed. Now, I am confident, and this is important, I am confident that the winds and the storms and the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. You know, there's been a lot of negative things about the said to the church. We've given lots of reasons to say negative things, I suppose. But she's still the bride, and she is still beautiful, and she is still worth fighting for. Amen? <laughs> and the church as the church will always be obedient. Individuals may not be obedient, but the church as the church was promised. The question we ask ourselves is, what does it look like for us to build our foundation to be obedient to Jesus, particularly in the little things? I think a danger that we have is we compare ourselves to other people. When we talk about how faithful we are to the Lord and how obedient we are to the Lord and how good we are to the Lord and all these kinds of things, we compare ourselves to the person down in the street. It's like, well, I'm not as bad as that person. Right? So I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, if we think of a scale of 1 to 10 in obedience, I'm a solid 8 because they're a 6. So it's just I'm glad I'm not them, right? 
The problem is, is that we'll, the measure with which we compare ourselves ought not be our neighbor, ought not be our spouse, it ought to be Jesus, right? He's the one that I compare myself to. And the reality is, in the light of that, there is always greater room for me to give and pre present to the Lord greater obedience to what he's called us to. It's one of the reasons I love the wedding of Cana. It's the fourth chapter of John, and it's just such a beautiful, I love the fact, I love, love, love being Catholic, amen? I love being Catholic. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, I've been able, yeah, I've been able to travel a little bit, and you can go to the various countries, and you can tell the countries that have kind of this Catholic personality, this Catholic spirit. I mean, go to Spain or go to Italy, are there struggles and mess? Yeah, of course, but they're also, in the midst of their mess, they're having a glass of wine, all right? That's a good thing, brothers and sisters, right? Right? That's a good thing. That's a good thing. But I love the wedding at Cana. I just love the fact that the first miracle that Jesus does is let's, uh, let's get some wine, right? We've got a major party. If you've not seen The Chosen, uh, the episode, yeah, The Chosen is really, really beautiful. But the episode, the episode of the wedding at Cana is really beautiful. There's one, I can't remember which of the disciples is dancing, and he just doesn't dance very well. And they say, Jesus, can you do something for him? He goes, I can't even help that, right? <laughs> right? But I love the reality that in the midst of this, they're having a big party. And Jesus' first act is to be able to change water into wine. But what I love the text where they say, where Mary says, do whatever he tells you. I mean, when I die, if they put, as a friar, I know exactly what they're going to put on the gravestone because they, except for my name, they put everything is exactly the same. But I would love it if they actually put on my gravestone, he said yes. Because that's what I want. I just want to be able to say, Jesus, I said yes to whatever you asked of me. And I love that text from Mary. She says, do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he asks of you. At the heart of this, brothers and sisters, is a, is a spirit and a, a part of us that wants to be obedient to whatever. It, I mean, the craziness that there is, whatever Jesus asks of us. And that's one of the reasons I love about be, being a Franciscan is because we have in a saint, St. Francis, who was willing to look like a fool for whatever it was that Jesus asked. Right? And we think of the saints and the Bernadette and Lourdes, who's, who's like just kind of getting, going through the mud and through the dirt because she said that there was going to be a fountain there, the living water that would come forth, and how foolish she must have looked like. And we have a history of saints that look foolish because they were going to be obedient to Jesus. And I want to guarantee you, if to the degree that you will be obedient to Jesus, you are going to look like a fool. And you are going to separate yourself from the world. The scripture says, wide is the road that leads to hell. And most people choose it. But narrow is the road that leads to life. And few people choose it. And it's difficult. And brothers and sisters, being obedient to, to Jesus is the narrow path. And it's difficult. And few people choose it. And we live in a world today that will point you out because you're choosing to live differently. Amen? And you will be mocked. And you will be called names that will use words like bigot, closed-minded, hater, homophobic, because we're being faithful to Jesus. I want to coin a phrase, a word, and it's called Catholic phobia. Or a cathophobe. And a cathophobe is an individual who believes just because I follow Jesus that I hate people that don't. And it's not true. And we can be faithful and obedient to the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of the church and still love and still care. Amen? But I guarantee you that the world will hate you if you're obedient to Jesus. And that's okay. And that's okay. Obedience, ultimately, brothers and sisters, is difficult. If it was easy to obey, or it is easier to obey, to do the things that I want to do. Dave, why don't you take a week and go to the Caribbean? All right, if I must, right? I love what Colby said, Maximilian Colby. He speaks about obedience. He says, in order that obedience be supernatural, it must not proceed from reason, but from faith. 
if my obedience, and we're going to talk in a moment how Jesus' obedience was supernatural. If my obedience from, is going to be supernatural, it can't just be because I figured out this makes sense. If, if, if my obedience demands that I have this always this intellectual exercise that says, okay, yes, this makes sense to me, I'm going to do it. Colby says it's not supernatural, it's not graced. It's just the flesh. For me, it was last spring. And COVID was crazy. You know, and, and, and I think at times we, we are very critical of everybody, both sides, everybody, because nobody knew what the heck was going on. And I remember the day that the bishop called me and he said, Dave, we, and it was funny because I, this is awful, I, I admit this. Other dioceses were closing the, uh, things down and our diocese closed things down later. But I sent the email to the bishop thanking him for not closing things down with the feeling that he would probably have to do it in about a week. And I remember the call, and he said, you know, we can't have public masses anymore. I never imagined as a priest that I would not be able to celebrate mass with the congregation. It never crossed my mind. But I also remember actually in this field house on this stage 25 years and nine days ago, I knelt down in front of the bishop and I promised I would be obedient. And I promised I would be obedient. And if I'm only obedient when I feel like it or when I like what they're being said, what grace is there in that? Pagans do that. And I will say that that, that, that six weeks that we were having no public masses was, was in one way it was profoundly difficult and troubling and, and just a time of suffering. But in a way that I can't explain, there was a unity to Jesus that I had never experienced before. This closeness, this intimacy. We've got to be able to be obedient, especially in times that it doesn't make sense. You know, bishops uh, have a role. I, I firmly believe the worst job in the world right now is being a bishop. It's just, it's horrible. Somebody, it's like, well, you know, when you're a bishop, it's like, do not curse me, right? But this, this sense that we have, I mean, one of the things I was giving a talk, and I was talking about the bishops, and somebody came up to me afterwards, and they said, why would you talk, why would you listen to what the bishops are saying? Because I'm Catholic. And as soon as we're beginning, to, yeah, as soon as we begin to pick and choose, brothers and sisters, we're Protestant. As soon as we pick and choose, it's like, I'm going to listen to this. Or the, or the thing that people come to me, and they say, you know, well, I know the bishop said this, but I read this blogger, or I saw this YouTube. It's like, yeah, I remember a person who used to post. He posted 95 theses. We called him Martin Luther. He posted it on a door in a church in Wittenberg, and he got a lot of followers. And where's that led us? I recall Bob Rice tells a story about his pastor a number of years ago, and his bishop was really progressive and really liberal, and, and this his pastor was really conservative. And, and somebody came up to him, and he was kind of, kind of baiting him, and he said, well, you know, what do you think about your bishop and all the things that he's done? And, and, and this, this priest said, my bishop? He's my, he's my bishop. I would lay down my life for my bishop. He goes, I don't agree with everything he does, and I don't agree with everything he writes, but he's my bishop. And I will lay down my life for him. Brothers and sisters, for too often we have spoken about cafeteria Catholics. And that we pick and choose. My experience is in the last 15 or 20 years, the tides have turned. Yeah. We have to ask ourselves, are we willing to be obedient? And I go back to what Colby says. That obedience at the heart of it, when it becomes supernatural, is when it is preceded by, re not by reason, but by faith. When I was a postulant, one of the professors I had was talking about struggles that he had with the church or struggles that he had with individuals in the church. And he said, there has to be some place, some time, where I bow my head and I submit to obedience. And I suggest that at that moment, it's what separates us as Catholics and as Christians. And we define ourselves that what we're going to do is we are going to be obedient as Jesus was. Amen? Amen? Because, that's fine, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap.
Matthew 21, 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty deeds in your name? And then I will turn and I will say solemnly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoer. That is one of the scariest scriptures in, in the entire Bible. It scares the crap out of me. Like, Jesus, am I doing what you want? Am I being obedient to what you're asking of me? Because I can give all these talks, and I can do all these things, and I can say how great you are and how wonderful, and I can look so reverent and holy. But Jesus says that person won't necessarily enter the kingdom of God. Only the ones that are, who are obedient will enter the kingdom of God. One of the things that I love is that obedience allows us to be able to see God do really cool things. Right? Peter, get out of that boat. And he just begins to walk upon water. I mean, I would love to if I just like walking, right? How cool is that? That, that this, these people got to see literally Peter walk on water because he was obedient. You know, I know people who have done things that have been kind of crazy or seem kind of crazy. And then you look back and it's like, by your obedience, that was really amazing. And thank you for letting us be a part of that. And thank you for letting us see that. I think sometimes by us not being obedient, we, we, we inhibit the Lord from doing the great work that he wants to do. And when we submit ourselves and we say, Jesus, I'm going to be obedient to whatever it is that you ask of me, even though it might look foolish, and even though intellectually it may not make sense, but I trust in faith that you're going to do great things and people begin to walk on water. Amen? I think that's what the Lord wants us to do, get out of the boat and walk on water. Now, one of the dilemmas and one of the struggles is, and we hear it all the time, is that Jesus wouldn't ask something of me that's so difficult. We particularly hear this common in the, in the younger population today. And it's often revolved around our moral teachings. Jesus, God wouldn't ask something of me that is so difficult. I think of the rich young man in the 14th chapter of Luke. Runs up to Jesus and says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? This is what you have to do. Sell all you have and follow me. You can't do that. It's a really sad scripture. He walks away. And he says his face fails. He walks away sad. Now, what Jesus doesn't do is, ah, I didn't think that was going to be so hard. I didn't think you being obedient to what I was asking was going to be so difficult. So come back here. All right, what do you want to do? You don't want to sell all your, I'm not going to ask something difficult of you. What do you want to do to inherit eternal life? Okay, do that. Right? That's fine. Go ahead and do that. He asks profoundly difficult things of us. There was a quote that I read recently, and it's about this whole woke population that, that's spiritual but not religious. And one of the persons says, we don't want to reject religion outright, but we don't want to be restricted by it. So what they're saying is that they want to create a God in their own image who does not place any boundaries upon them. Let's be clear. When Jesus asks difficult things as it relates to obedience, we hear in Hebrews 5, 8, Son though he was, he learned obedience by what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. You know, we think a lot about Jesus' suffering, and I'm going to talk about it in a moment, but just think about this. We, we think about the suffering and the passion, but think about the suffering that Jesus experiences all the time, but particularly experienced then. We all know the suffering that we experience by loved ones who turn away from the Lord, who walk away from him. My guess is we all have somebody in our life, in our family, that's done horrible things. And we see that, and, and that helplessness, and saying, I know that your life could be different if you would just do that. There's a suffering in that. And Jesus, Jesus continues and suffered because of that. He looks at me and he says, Dave, if you would just do this differently, and out of his love for us, yeah, he suffers. He learned obedience by what he suffered. Our salvation, brothers and sisters, come about because of Jesus' suffering. 
I take profound consolation in Jesus' time in the garden where Jesus was being asked to do something profoundly difficult. And what I love about this is Jesus didn't like just walk up there. It's like, yep, yep, here we go. Right here, we, actually right here would probably be better. Let me help you out, right? I mean, we have this, we have this image of, of Jesus and, and he's struggling and he's wrestling with this. I read an article one time that, that compared and contrasted Socrates' death, who goes to his death and he drinks very, very courageously the hemlock and he drinks that and, and, and Jesus suffers. He says, I don't want to do this. And he goes back to the Father and he says, if there's any other way, come, come, there's got to be another way. Let's, let's talk about this. And he goes back to his friends and he says, can't you just stay awake with me just, just for a moment? Just, I love the reality that Jesus was wrestling with what the Father was asking of him. And he says, if there could be any other way, think about it just another day. There's got to be something else we could do here. And then he says what I hope I can say, not my will, but yours. Not, not mine. And, and I know that what you're going to ask of me and I know that what you're going to ask of other people is difficult. But it's something that Jesus, Jesus isn't going to ask anything of us that he hasn't done himself. His obedience cost him his life. And I can't say that that's ever happened to me. I had the occasion a number of years ago to go to China, and I was dealing with this one gentleman, and he told me the story of his uncle. And his uncle in the 50s was arrested, and he was put in prison. And the guards were continually saying, if you just renounce your faith, we'll let you go free. And he's like, I'm not going to renounce my faith. I'm a Catholic Christian, and I'm not going to renounce that. So day after day after month after year would go, and they would say, if you just renounce it. So one day, he'd literally been in prison for years. One day, he said, okay, you just had enough. He said, enough. I, I, I don't believe it. And they were, they were faithful to him. They said, okay, you can go home. So this guy goes home, but he didn't exactly think through his entire plan because he goes home and his family says to him, it's so great to see you. And they're giving him hugs and how wonderful it is. And then they ask him, why did they let you out? He hadn't thought that through. And he had to tell them why they let him out of prison. So what does he do? He goes back to prison the next day. And he renounces his renunciation. <laughs> and they killed him. This person's uncle is a martyr because he was obedient to Jesus. I spent some time in Iraq with the Chaldean community in March. Amen. And I asked one of them, I said, what was it like? And they talk about what it was like under ISIS and what was going on there. And I asked the bishop, I said, how many priests do you know that were killed, that were martyred? And he started it. Being in Iraq and listening to them talk about being disciples of Jesus is really different than what we experience here. Right? Obedient to death. What's it cost us? What's it cost us? We have got to remember, brothers and sisters, that the obedience, our salvation, comes about through Jesus' obedience to the Father. And it's going to be the same for me, and it's going to be the same for you, to be obedient even unto death. And there are some teachings that are harder and more difficult than others. And we can't just pick and choose which one we're going to abide by. So when Jesus says in Matthew 5, 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of the Heavenly Father. That this is a commandment that we have and that we've got to be obedient. We have to be obedient to loving our brothers and sisters and to be obedient to loving our enemy. I love what Sarah was talking about yesterday. She was saying that God, what we have is he's got a bunch of children. In God's world, there aren't enemies. There's his kids. We create enemies, but God doesn't create enemies. And brothers and sisters, what should make and should mark the Catholic Church is different is our ability to love. 
our ability to love those people that we disagree with, to dialogue, to engage, to talk, to be present. We have got to be, if we as the body of Christ don't love well, why do we expect anybody else to love well? Amen? And it has got to be for that person. We have got, when Jesus says, love your enemy, who is that person? That person that you just can't stand, that commentator on TV, or those people, right? Those people. Those are the people that Jesus commands us to love. And we have to ask ourselves, am I obedient to, I'm obedient to this. I go to Mass every Sunday, but I'm not obedient to this because those people drive me nuts. And I can hate them because they're not living the way they should live. Right? Love your enemies. It will be what marks us as a Catholic Christian community. I mean, you look at some of the stuff online and some of the blogs and YouTubes, it's like, if this demonstrates faith, if this demonstrates charity, I don't want anything to do with that. The reality is we are the greatest scandal in the church. It's not the people who don't believe. It's the people who profess to be Catholic and Christian because we can't be obedient to love. Amen? Amen. Yeah, we clap, but it's really, really difficult. Amen? Jesus says, love as I have loved you to the point of death. Bart last night talked about the church being the body of Christ. And that we need to look differently in the world. I recall one of our uh, alumni, she was out, she's a nurse, and she was working in a hospital. And they just mentioned to her that, that she, the way she treated one of these patients, he said, you know, how is it that you, you, there's something different about you? There's something different about the way you care for them. They said, how is it? How is it that you do that? And she had one simple answer. She says, I've been loved much. If we want to transform and change the world, we have got to be able to engage and love. That's what's going to change those people's heart. Not our hate, not our condemnation. Amen? Oh, jeez. Okay. Matthew 18. Peter approaches asking, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how many times must I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. Can I be obedient to that? That individual who just drives me crazy, the individual who's hurt me, and not just the individual who's hurt me in the past, but the one who continues to hurt me. Can I forgive them seven times, seven times? Bear in mind, brothers and sisters, that there is a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. We are commanded to forgive. And that's a question of the heart. It's an act of the will. It's a decision. I forgive. Why? Because Jesus has forgiven me. And Jesus says in the scriptures, if you do not forgive your brother, I can't forgive you. So we need to be obedient to forgiveness. It's a question of the heart. It's a decision. Jesus, I forgive so and so. Reconciliation is different. I used to think reconciliation was possible. Reconciliation is between two people, and both people have to be desirous of reconciling. That's hard. It's not always possible. Forgiveness is always possible. Take a blank piece of paper and at the top of it write their name and say, I forgive you for. And just fill it out. And just keep on writing. Jesus commanded, are we obedient? Jesus says in the scriptures in Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father. We are commanded to make disciples. Let's not overthink this. Let's not make it more difficult. Go and develop relationships. Engage people. Talk to them. Share with them your story. Make disciples. Amen? Finally, an example of obedience. This is the year, obviously, of St. Joseph. And I was really pleased when the Holy Father chose to make this year a special focus of obedience of, of St. Joseph. And as I was praying and reflecting, it seems to me uh, Joseph was an obedient follower. The Holy Father said in his document on St. Joseph, he said, In the first dream, the angel helps him resolve his grave dilemma. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Joseph's response was immediate. 
When Joseph awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Obedience made it possible for him to surmount the difficulties and to spare Mary. In every, Holy Father would go on to say, in every situation, Joseph declared his own fiat, like those of Mary in the Annunciation and Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. In his role as the head of the family, Joseph taught Jesus to be obedient to his parents in accordance to the Father's command. I love this. Again, we're going back to what Colby said. Colby said that it doesn't always make sense, but we're obedient. Imagine the Mar our Blessed Mother. You are going to be with child, and it's going to be the power, the power of the Holy Spirit. That makes sense. Yes, all right? And then Joseph. It's like, okay, Joseph, this guy is confident in his dreams, okay? I've got weird dreams, all right? But Joseph has this dream. It says, don't worry. This is why it's happening. What does Joseph do? It says, if we go to the Scriptures, it says immediately at night... Right? When they went to Egypt, immediately at night, he was obedient and took Jesus and his wife to Egypt. I, I found myself reflecting on this, this relationship between Joseph and Jesus. Joseph was his dad, right? Joseph was his Abba, his Papa. And Joseph, Jesus learned obedience because he watched Joseph. I'm sure Jesus said, okay, tell me the story again. Well, you were born, and I had this dream. And in this dream, an angel said to me, take you to Egypt. That is so weird. So I spent three years in Egypt. Yeah, you spent a couple years in Egypt. That is so weird. But the reason you did this is because the angel said to do it. Yep. Jesus grew up watching his daddy be obedient to whatever. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. But he learned obedience from watching his father. And one of the things that I loved about Joseph was that he sees that a part of obedience is acceptance. And the Holy Father would go on to say, he said, often in life, things happen whose meanings we do not understand. And our first reaction is frequently one of disappointment or rebellion. Joseph set aside his own ideas in order to accept the course of events. And the mysterious as they seem to embrace them and take responsibility for them and make them a part of his own story. Unless we are reconciled with our own story, we will be able to take a single step forward, for we will always remain hostage to our expectations and the disappointments that follow. Joseph, in the midst of circumstances that he didn't want, he didn't ask for, he couldn't imagine, was obedient to what God asked him. And because of this, he formed Jesus who would remember, who would pay attention, who would watch, and it ultimately invited him to be obedient to what the Father asked of him. And let's not lose sight that the only reason you're sitting here and I'm sitting here is because he was obedient, obedient to what the Father asked. Just one thing, just one thing. What's your one thing?